Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Dewey Godfrey. I'm the coordinator of the uh, lecture and gallery series for the Art and Art History Department. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge, with respect, the United Indian Nation on whose ancestral lands Colgate University is located. Uh, thanks to you, those of you who are joining us online. Um, uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, Josh McPhee and Judy Seidman. Uh, this is an, uh, another event, a conversation, and an ongoing series of events, uh, Graphic Liberation, organized by Josh McPhee, our Christian A. Johnson artists in residence. I'd like to thank Josh, uh, Lynn Schwarzer, Bryn Hatton, Angela Kowalski, Lois Wilcox, Mark Williams, and many others, uh, especially Sarah Curtis and Doug Watson in IT for helping us um, put on these series of lectures. Um, first during uh, the pandemic when we were not able to gather in person and now that we can gather in person, but also facilitating the online portion of this event. Uh, this is the last week before break, so there are no announcements, no upcoming events until we return uh, in 10 days time. I look forward to seeing you all after the break. Josh McPhee is a designer, artist, and archivist. He's a founding member of both the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative, a decentralized group of political artists from the US, Canada, and Mexico, and Interference Archive, a public collection of cultural materials produced by social movements based in Brooklyn, New York. McPhee is the author and editor of numerous publications, including Signs of Change, Social Movement Cultures, 1960s to Now, and Signal, a journal of international political graphics and culture. Judy Seidman was born in Norwalk, Connecticut, and went to the Akimoto Secondary School in Ghana, and then to the University of Madison, Wisconsin at Madison, where she received her BA in sociology and an MFA in painting in 1972. Since then, she has worked as an artist and cultural activist within South Africa's liberation movement in Zambia, Swaziland, and Botswana. In Gaborone, she was a member of the Medu Art Ensemble, an art making collective aimed at creating culture within the liberation struggle in South Africa. Judy moved to Johannesburg in 1990, where she still lives and paints today. Since 2007, she has facilitated art making workshops that use the visual arts to explore personal histories and social awareness. She has written extensively on the South African poster movement and the arts and culture within the liberation sculpture. Please join me in welcoming Josh and Judy. Thanks, DeWitt. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the seventh conversation um, uh, that's part of Graphic Liberation with Colgate and the eighth in total. Um, I'm, uh, I'm talking to, to all of you from Brooklyn, New York, which is occupied Lenape Canarse land. And I have just a couple things to say before we jump right in. One, uh, thanks to DeWitt and Sarah and everyone at Colgate for their continued support of this project and this uh, series of conversations. Um, and then also to announce that there are two more that are coming up uh, this, this spring. Um, one is uh, on April 15th with Ting's Chat, who's an artist and designer and cultural worker who's part of the recreation, reimagining of the Tricontinental, which is a political organization that was originally founded in Cuba in the late 1960s and has sort of reemerged now as an internationalist uh, political group. And she's the sort of cultural um, czar of that organization um, and splits her time between China and Brazil. So we'll be talking to her on April 15th and then on April 24th, we're having a conversation with A3BC, which is a uh, Japanese uh, anti-militarist, anti-nuclear block printing collective based in Tokyo. Um, the, the April 24th event will be like this, a Wednesday event that's hosted by Colgate. April 15th is a Friday and that's gonna be hosted by the Cleveland Institute of Art. And you can find information about both of the events on justseeds.org. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be talking to Judy tonight. Um, we've known each other uh, for, I don't know, at least via communication 15 years or so. And then we met in Johannesburg a little shy of a decade ago. Um, I've been following her work, uh, both as an artist and as a, a poster 
uh, historian and, and researcher for you know 20 years, and I'm really really excited to to sort of have this conversation and and to really um, jump into her body of work, uh, which I think is is very unique uh, and and gets at a whole new range and set of issues that we haven't necessarily talked about in the previous conversation. So like all these talks, uh, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna go through four images that Judy's gonna briefly explain, which will give us sort of a visual benchmark uh, to then have the, the, the rest of the conversation sort of around. So it gives us a starting point so that you can focus on um, the conversation, but have some images kind of in the back of the mind as we continue to talk. So here we go. So I don't know if you want to just, you can just jump in and, um, and, and give me, you know, a minute or, or two about, about this image and then I'll click to the next one and we can, and then we just sort of jump, use this all as a jumping off point for, for the conversation. Okay. <laughs> this is a poster that was done with the Meadow Art Ensemble, which was a collective of artists based in Haberone, Botswana, just outside of, in fact, nine kilometers outside of the South African borders in 1982. So it was still under the uh, period when apartheid was, of course, dominant. Um, this poster was actually designed to commemorate and to mobilize around what's called the South African Freedom Charter, which was um, drafted in 1956 and became one of the founding documents of South Africa's both liberation movement and later democratic state. Mm -hmm. um, all of the slogans there, there shall be work and security, that all shall enjoy equal human rights, Africa Maya Buya, the people shall govern, all come from that document. Um, this poster was done after a collective discussion that we wanted to produce uh, a poster commemorating the Freedom Charter, which, by the way, I should, of course, add, it was at that stage highly illegal to do anything advancing the ANC in, inside South Africa. And um, you could, and people did get sentenced to five years in jail for so-called advancing the aims of a bandit organization, which the ANC was at that stage. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess the only other thing I should say this, the drawing was actually based upon a photograph by a photographer named Ellie Weinberg, who took a photograph took photographs of the Congress of the People in 1956, 126, which adopted the Cong the mm -hmm. Freedom Charter. Um, and he, you could see the perspective is from slightly overhead, because Ellie was actually banned by the South African government at the time. So he was not allowed to be amongst the crowd of people. And he was in a two-story building across the street, taking photographs of the crowd through the window. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. Um, oh, and I should say, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I mean, if you want to say, we can, I can go back. No, no, the, the other comment was that having discussed the content of the poster, as a collective, it was then given to me to actually do the artwork and develop the silk screen. So we explored a lot of different ways of doing collective work, but that was one of the ones that worked quite well, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So shall I go with this one? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. This one. Um, was also a Meru poster, also 1982, which is exactly 40 years ago, actually. Um, and um, this one, we agreed we were going to do a poster to commemorate. There was a very strong women's movement from the 1950s. In 1956, 
there was a march of women on the head of government demanding that women should not have to, uh, black women should not have to carry passes because the apartheid system originally only demanded that men carry passes because mostly women were not allowed to live in the urban areas. So they, they didn't have to pr produce identification when they got stopped because they weren't supposed to be there. As they moved into urban areas, government decided to put, put in new laws to say carry passes and women started mobilizing against this. The actual wording this was also collectively discussed, both the symbol, the imagery, and the words. The words come from a song, which was sung at that demonstration in 1956. Um, now you have touched the woman, you have struck a rock, you have dislodged a boulder, and you will be crushed. Um, directed towards, uh, at that point, I believe it was Foster. John Forster, the president of South Africa. Um, the only other thing I should say about this was having agreed that we would do a picture of a strong woman and use those words, it was, we two of us were asked to work on possible designs. And we then took it back to the collective and the collective had comments on both of them. Um, my design, which was basically this one, originally she was carrying a gun, uh, uh, MK, uh, an AK-47. And the group decided that we did not wish to enrage the South African <laughs> apartheid regime any more than it already was enraged about the work we were doing, and we would not be showing people carrying guns or should not show people carrying guns. This was a policy that came and went at different points over the time that I was admitting. But we then decided to change it from a gun to the clenched fist and a broken chain. Um, also probably because most of these posters were distributed inside South Africa, they were smuggled inside and put up. Um, the consequences for people caught with them inside the country if she was actually carrying a gun, would have been much more serious. So, <laughs> so anyhow, with that change, the group agreed that we would go with this design. And um, this actually became one of the best known posters in the South African Liberation Movement. It's interesting because I don't, I wonder whether it would have aged as well, so to speak, if it had had the AK. Had <laughs> Hard to tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, this one was much more recently. This was about 10 years ago, I think. Um, and it was with a group called the One in Nine Campaign, which uh, the, the name comes from at the time that it was formed, which was 2007. Um, one in nine women who were raped in South Africa reported it to the police. And of the ones who reported it to police, one in 15 actually got a conviction. So you could work out for yourself <laughs> how bad it actually was. Um, it was also the one in nine campaign was um, started at the time of the uh, those of you who follow South African politics, the person who was aspiring to be president, who turned out to be incredibly corrupt, and we got rid of him about three years ago, Jacob Zuma, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, was actually, just before he was elected president, was tried for raping a young woman, a much, much younger woman. Um, and he ran a very politic, politicized campaign attacking her as somebody who was really sleeping around and she was set up to keep him out of the presidency, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the women's movements and the activists working on gender issues came together to, to form what was called the One in Nine campaign. 
Um, and this poster was also discussed collectively. Uh, we had about 30 people talking about, we wanted to do a poster that said that it was not only anti-rape but it, and anti-gender-based violence, but it was all of the issues around patriarchy that had to be addressed. Um, and uh, we went through long discussions about each of those words in the slogan, patriarchy, poverty, gender-based violence, et cetera. Um, about a year after it was done, there was a decision that we should add um, transgender phobia and so forth. And then there was a big debate. They didn't want to change it having once made the decision. So <laughs> it went back and forth. I think it remained this way in the end. <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay. And this one was actually a very recent one. It was done about last year. I think it was July was when they did this one. Um, you will see, uh, Josh mentioned that um, Ting's Jack, Jack, Jack will be speaking in the next one of these. And this was the organization that she has um, put together. They were doing an international exhibition. It was in the middle of COVID. And um, as a result, it was not a particularly collectively designed poster. F from my perspective, we were all under lockdown with, um, <laughs> with COVID. But um, I sort of thought it would be interesting to show today because in the context of what's going on in the Ukraine, um, I think the message is a very important one for all of us in various ways. And I think I've always thought that posters change as time changes and the issues change and how people read in, what people read into them will also change. And what reading into this now, for me, looking at this six months later or nine months later after we did it, um, it raises a whole lot of other questions about the particular war that's going on at the moment. Um, I think I'm going to leave that one <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, maybe I should say one other thing, which is that one of the things that came out of the work we did with Meduat and Sambo from the 40 years ago was that there are different kinds of posters. I mean, there are some posters that are just telling you, telling you about an event that you have to go to. There are some posters that are educating you. This one was intended as an educational poster and the intent was it would be sort of maybe on the wall of a building where people went by and so forth, so you could talk about it and sit, think about it a bit. Um, properly, it was done for an exhibition run by the Tricontinental Organization, which asked for international artists to work on the theme of imperialism's hybrid voice. So, yeah. Okay. Let's 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 jump right into this conversation. I mean, the thing that really strikes me about that work, um, I mean, the, the final piece aside, although I think, you know, arguably it's was still uh, collaborative in some ways, is is these these ways of creating things that clearly your hand is a part of, but that come out of these processes that involve other people, and. I think that we could probably make a kind of grand argument that all cultural production is collaborative in some sense because we're always absorbing influences and having conversations and things like that. But but these are clearly much more intentional examples. And so I'm wondering if that 
could be a lens to, to sort of jump back to the late 1970s. I mean, I'm assuming that Meidu was where you really started to first experiment with that. To sort of talk a little bit about how you got involved in Meidu and and some of that sort of social process that was in the background that people just looking at the images maybe wouldn't be able to to know. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, I met one of my um, co. Uh, we used to call ourselves cultural workers in Medu. Was an artist named Tommy Minelli, um, and he used to say that Medu was for all of us. Uh, a, a university in, in learning about art. I mean, I was always interested in political art. Um, I was, uh, I when I started studying art seriously at university level, it was during the anti-war movement at the University of Wisconsin. So, I mean, that's where I learned to sell screen <laughs> and so on. But In Medu, we actually talked about how do you make work collective and what does it mean to make it collective? So we would talk about what the ideas were that went into it. Um, we tried different ways of experimenting. I mean, sometimes somebody would come along and say, I've got a great idea for a poster. I want to do this. And then we would talk about that idea. Other times we would come as with the, your, um, well, actually with both both those first two posters, the People Shall Govern and the um, You Have Struck a Rock, the, uh, the group decided we would do a poster on that subject, but first on the Freedom Charter and then on, um, on Women's Day, but gender issues in general. Women's Day in South Africa. It wasn't at that point Women's Day in South Africa, of course. That came much later. <laughs> um, I like to think that that poster was actually one of the things that made, made it into Women's Day. I mean, the August 9th March was important, but commemorating that March and putting it back on the calendar after having disappeared for like, whatever it was, 15 years in the history of South Africa was quite important. <laughs> Um, but in any case, um, how you come up with a collective image or a collectively agreed image that speaks to people. I mean, you have to think about what you're trying to say and how you see the imagery, but also how other people will interpret the imagery. And that changes all the time so that as with perhaps, as with that picture um, on imperialist wars, I certainly see it differently in the context of the Ukraine stuff <laughs> than I did at the time when I was first thinking of designing it. I mean, I would like to think it might strengthen the picture actually, <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, Yeah, I, so I think I've lost my train of thought here. No worries. <laughs> We're talking about collective. Yeah, like how, how, <laughs> oh, we, I, oh, how, how I got involved, how I got into it. Okay, so, okay, I have this rather weird background. I was brought up by a more or less left-wing American family in um, Connecticut, Till I was 11 um, and I'm ancient. I was born in 1951. So um, in some ways, the community that I was brought up in, which was actually an interracial cooperative that was set up with people for, by people who were essentially trying to get away from the McCarthy period, <laughs> simply <laughs> um, not exactly going into a retreat, but um, a place where there was at least some space to interact. 
Um, it's called Village Creek. It was actually the first interracial cooperative on the eastern coast of the United States, I believe. And it was set up the year I was born in 1951. And I lived there until I was um, 11. And my parents, I think, got quite despairing about the things that were going on. This was just at the beginning of when Kennedy came into place, but it was at the time of the Bay of Pigs and it was um, the civil rights movement was successful, but wasn't clear where it was going at that point. Um, in any case, my parents got offered a job in Ghana and in West Africa, and they decided, right, we're packing up all five children and everything else and going to Ghana. So I went to secondary school in West Africa, um, in Ghana. And in fact, my interest in African art particularly came from there. Um, my first teacher in my boarding school in Ghana was somebody named Kofi Antebom, who was and still is one of I mean, he's, he's long deceased, but um, he was one of the leading African artists looking at what it meant to do art in independent Africa. And that certainly affected my conception of the world. Um, in 19, <laughs> in 1966, um, when Nkrumah was overthrown, my parents, my father used to claim he was the first, <laughs> he booked the first flight out of Ghana after the coup against the Kuma, back to the US where he got a job in Wisconsin and then I went to University of Wisconsin, which is where I was involved in the anti-war movement and all of that. And when I finished university, which was then by 72, my parents were teaching in Zambia and I went to visit them and basically stayed. <laughs> um, so I was very much interested, really ever since living in Ghana, with how the visual arts spoke to how the world was changing around us and how people dealt with that. Um, and in Zambia, I was there, I think, for a couple of years. Anyhow, I got married I, um, to a historian who specialized in Southern Africa. I was always interested in, really, from the time I was in Ghana, I was fascinated by what was going on in terms of apartheid and so forth. Um, and the issues of race were always very upfront in my life. They had to be since, <laughs> I mean, by, in my boarding school in Ghana, there were exactly out of the 450 students in the boarding school, um, my sister and me and my brother were the only whites for all except six weeks in the four and a half years I spent there. <laughs> um, and it gives you a different perspective on what race is about. <laughs> um, and I was always <sighs> fascinated and horrified by what we saw about South Africa, which at that point, with the crackdown on the ANC from 1960 and Sharpeville and so forth, you were getting people coming as refugees from South Africa, flying into Ghana. There was a flight that went from Ghana, from Johannesburg to Ghana, to Accra, to um, London once a week. And that was, my parents were part of a team of people who would come and welcome refugees getting off the plane. Um, I was in boarding school, so I wasn't part of that, but I was certainly very aware of it and um, fascinated by 
the way people were organizing against essentially institutionalized racism of absolutely the worst sort, which is, I think, what we all felt apartheid was. Um, anyway, uh, so my ideas about art came from there, in fact, and um, and partly from Kofi Antobam. Kofi Antobam was also one of the leading artists in the Pan-Africanist art movement. And while I was a small child in <laughs> his classes, which <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure he was particularly aware that I was there at all, but I certainly learned a hell of a lot from him. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to Wisconsin where at that, that was the time of the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement. And so my interest in public art was linked to that. And then when I got to Zambia, for a whole series of reasons, not quite chance, um, we had quite a lot to do with the, the ANC. South Africa's liberation movements had set up a liberation center in Zambia. Um, one of my sisters actually got a job as a secretary in the ANC office. And um, the first poster I ever did for the ANC was actually, there was a bomb in the office. I was driving my sister back from, she had come home to lunch. This My sister was um, 17 at the time. She was taking a gap year between uh, college and university um, and working as a secretary at the, at the desk in the ANC offices. And the bomb went off just as we arrived there. So it killed um, a young man named John Dubé and um, who was working at the desk that my sister worked at. And if she hadn't come home for lunch, she would have died. So the first poster I did for the ANC was actually a poster for the funeral of John Dubé, because we did not have, we didn't have any photographs of him because they didn't like to take photographs of people who were in exile. Um, so I did a graphic for the funeral. After that, I did ongoing work for the ANC occasionally and around the South African Liberation Movement, got involved with that. I also got married. My husband was a historian specializing in Southern Africa. So he then got a job in Swaziland and we lived in Swaziland for five years. And then he got a job in Botswana and we moved to Botswana for the next 10 years. So in Botswana, I got involved with this group called Medu Art Ensemble, which was basically set up to do art around the liberation movement in South Africa. And um, that was the, I mean, for me, that was the, <laughs> the second university, a much more intense university than, than the one in the States in terms of learning what, what for me art was about um, and how I fit into what I was trying to say with my art and all of that. And also working with collectives. And we did quite a lot of experimenting with collectives. I mean, was it better to actually draw together that didn't work too well most of the time. When it did, it was amazing. It was completely mind-blowing. Um, I think it's a bit like the difference between playing a piece of music that you're taught to play a little bit. I'm not a musician, so <laughs> I've never been very good at music. But, but the comparison would be playing a piece that, that you were taught from a, a script and working in a group where you're improvising and working off each other and so on. And uh, 
once or twice in my life, we actually did collective works working at the same thing where particularly me and Tommy, Tommy would start to draw something and I take the pen away and say, we could do it this way. And he'd take the bed back and say, yes, and we should add this as well. And it was a picture that neither of us could conceivably have come up with. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, some of the most exciting art that I've ever done was done that way. Um, were you drawing, was the group drawing from examples they knew of, of kind of collective practice, or was it all just sort of learning on the ground? Um, so Medu came out of, um, actually came out of uh, the, well, th there's a whole series of things. Um there was, because, because Aparte actually tried to crush a lot of the artistic expression amongst the Black population. There's no other way to put it. I mean, it was a vicious, a, a truly vicious system on many, many levels, but in terms of the arts, it did not recognize creative arts within the black population. It didn't teach them. You were allowed to do traditional crafts as defined by, they had boards which defined what a traditional craft was. And, um, but as so that, that, that many of the creative arts that were done within the black population, especially, um, develop their own ideas about what would be the correct, what would be the appropriate way to look at art. And there was quite a lot of talk about what makes art Africanist as opposed to imported imperialist art. I mean, there were lots of issues around there, there were questions about whether, as somebody who was white, one should be part of that collective. Um, and these were not instant answer questions. <laughs> these debates went on forever and are still going on today. <laughs> In fact, I mean, obviously, I have my own answers to that. Um, but one of them is that certainly my experience as some strange once American, brought up in West Africa, back in America, you know, not speaking many of the South African languages, not having lived under apartheid as oppression. My understanding of what I was seeing and doing was very different from some of the people I work with. Um, that didn't make it less valid, it made it different. And maybe for me, the collective stuff was particularly important because I was learning about how other people saw and experienced things that I didn't know about. Um, and so that whole working out how those things worked collectively, how it spoke to my understanding of, of what I had been through, um, my funny different experiences in other countries of how the racial stuff worked out, for instance. Um, all of these fed into the way we theorized about art and developed theories about it. And it was incredibly intense. I mean, as some, Tommy, I think, actually once called, called Medu a university in its own right. <laughs> um, and I certainly felt I learned much more there than I did at university. I mean, I learned quite a lot at Wisconsin. I'm not blaming Wisconsin, but <laughs> It was it was an overwhelming experience in many ways.
Um, yeah. Anyways, so yeah. I'm not sure if I've. <laughs> I mean, you, I've dealt with <laughs> you, you mentioned um, this sort of question around. Uh, imperialism or like the sort of imposition of external cultural sort of values or representations. And I, I wonder how that relates to, or is sort of in this conversation with Pan-Africanist values of, of representation and, and aesthetics given particularly like that Nidu had a music unit that was largely producing jazz. And there's sort of this conversation between South African and American jazz music. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, the, the other answer is about four books long. <laughs> um, but um, so, I mean, jazz in the South African context is really very interesting because one of the parts of culture that the South African apartheid government refused to accept was jazz. They felt it was uh, a racially mixed hybrid, which didn't really speak to anything. And they didn't quite not allow it, but they didn't allow whites and blacks to play in the same spaces, for instance. Or when they did, you lied about it. So for black musicians to play with a white band, um, it was, there were, there were some areas, certainly at night in a white area and you didn't have jazz venues in black areas, meant that they might be behind a screen or they were never admitted that they were actually performing there, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, they, it was crazy. It was, there were many things about apartheid that were crazy, but in culture as much as anything else. As a result, you had people talking. I mean, there was a reason that there was a, the arts in the 1960s particularly um, developed a very strong Black consciousness approach in South Africa. And it was valid under those kinds. I mean, not, not valid. I mean, it it was a reality that people were dealing with. Um, blacks didn't have art schools or very, very, very few when they were private and, or private or um, non-government owned and they were always on the edge of being closed down. And um, uh, there was no art except for traditional crafts which were very narrowly defined taught in black schools. Um, they had something that they taught in black schools called skills and techniques, which was on the ground that blacks weren't really creative, they could only do. And essentially they defined skills and techniques in the fifties when they introduced it under apartheid as um, teaching people to manipulate small things so they would be able to work on an assembly line. Um, and no creative whatsoever. And um, so you then had, by the late 60s and early 70s, you had a very conscious development of an understanding of art as to who you were talking to, what you were talking about, that Pan-African art was um, was not something that came in with the imperialists. It was something that people developed to speak about their own lives. There was also a strong feeling that the divisions between the types of art so or types of cultural production, so between music and visual arts and theater and poetry, et cetera, were fairly artificial and we should look at how they integrated. 
So, I mean, it was a, as I said, for, for me, it was, it was a completely different university than my university education. Not that my university education was in Wisconsin was a bad one. It was a very good one. But um, I certainly thought about what it meant to be creative and what one was trying to say in a completely different kind of way. Um, and yeah. And that stuff still has, by the way, still has to be captured. And we are um, currently putting up a website that is supposed to be looking at the product of what Meru did in its years of existence um, with the Bits History Workshop and historical papers. Should be up in about a month's time. <laughs> uh, that's great for people to have access. That is, I mean, we always said that that needs to be publicized, but it's now 40 years later. I should also add, because I'm sure people don't know that history, Medu Art Ensemble, which was this group in Botswana, um, existed from 1978, which was before I got there. I got there in 1980. Um, and it was destroyed in 1985 with a military raid by the South African Defense Force, which killed um, 12 people on the 14th of June, 1985, including the artist Tommy Minnelli, which is one reason I'm, I mean, it, but he was by far our best artist. I mean, if there is such a thing, I mean, he was just an incredible visual artist. And um, and also a range of other people, a number of whom were in Medu, most of whom were, not most, a number were in Medu. Some of them were innocent people who just happened to be in the way of, <laughs> of the hit squads. Um, yeah. And then Meru ceased to exist at that point, essentially. Um, and most of the South African exiles who had been in Meru then either left Botswana or went very underground. <laughs> And I decided to stay um, because I figured as an American citizen, I was probably much safer. And in fact, I actually do know because it came out when South Africa had its TRC hearings after the Mandela government was put into place, the Truth and Reconciliation hearings. There was a hearing specifically on the Haberoni raid, it was called, the one that destroyed Medi. And they had a security policeman talking about um, how they chose the targets and so forth. And to my shock and horror, I was sitting in the audience. This guy puts up a PowerPoint with their first list of, of people they were planning to hit, my name was on it. And then apparently they took it off because I was an American citizen and a woman and had two children and was not known to be involved in anything <laughs> particularly violent at that point. <laughs> and um, so I was no longer a target at the time the raid happened. Um, yeah. So, but they did target Meru, Meru members specifically. And it was, yeah. Um, anyways. <laughs> um, but from my perspective, I learned more than everything I know about art from Medu and for working in that collective. 
And I would say after 1985, when Meru was destroyed, I've been trying to put some of those lessons into place, perhaps. Um, I can't say I found a collective that was nearly as effective, although the one with the women's movement that I did, that patriarchy one, has also been very enlightening and exciting in its ways. In the context of um, political art, certainly here in, in the United States and in North America, there, there's often this sort of question of that gets raised about um, effectiveness. And um, it's often sort of a red herring kind of people raise it as a way to try to just disprove the value of, of art with any sort of social um, content. And, and what happened with Medu seems like is it's a very sort of powerful example of how for some people making culture and particularly culture that does have the potential or is making social impact, there are real stakes involved. And, and here oftentimes artists want it both ways. They want to talk about how political what they're doing is until it has an effect that sort of washes back on them. And then they want to say, Oh, it's just art. You know, it's just art. It can't hurt anyone. Um, and I'm kind of interested, like th this is a, a sort of object lesson um, in, in the fact that, that you can't, you can't have it both ways. Ultimately when there are real things at stake. And, we, and maybe your thoughts on on that and like where people went from after 85 and the sort of impacts of Medu's work. Yeah. So um, I, I, it, there are different ways maybe to deal with that. Um, in 1982, Medu hosted a subcontinent wide conference called the culture and resistance Con uh, symposium and an art festival that went with it which more or less defined resistance art in south africa for many years to come and um we are We've been trying to change the name, I think, to the culture of liberation rather than the culture of resistance for all sorts of reasons. But that was what the conference was about. And um, at that time, one of the resolutions of the conference, which was a five-day conference as well as a festival, was that... Um, we should call, say that art is a weapon of struggle. Um, it's something that we need to think about in terms of if we are involved in a, a life and death struggle, our art speaks to that. Um, I think uh, the person who gave the opening speech at the Culture and Resistance Festival was an artist and poet named Jacobi Wamakawe Martins. Dehobe um, <laughs> used the word, started out his speech with the, a line that went along the lines of art won't um, win a revolution, but it gives you a vision for what to do about it and it inspires you. That's, that's not a direct quote. Um, And I think that's that's something that we saw as um, critical. Saying that art is a weapon also worked both ways because the other side also saw it as a weapon. And one could argue that was one of the reasons that they, when they held the Habitoni Raid in 1985, they deliberately targeted people in Medu, amongst others. They also targeted ANC, people they thought were working with the ANC military, whatever, whatever, but they targeted Medu specifically. 
Um, and after the raid, one of the people who organized the raid from the South African side, who at that point was a colonel, Craig Williamson, went on South African television and held up drawings from Tommy Mignelli's portfolio, which had been taken after they killed him back to South Africa on the television to show that these were the kinds of terrible things that these, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that these people were killed were doing. Um, yeah. So, um, After, I mean, after the conference, a lot of the work that we did, people started actually making work like that inside South Africa under conditions of apartheid. And obviously they were under far more danger than we were sitting across the border in what was supposed to be relatively safe. I mean, we knew it wasn't safe. There were South African raids all the time on the frontline states but compared to somebody living in one of the townships, it was definitely much safer. And yet people went back, there were maybe a thousand people at the Cultural Resistance Symposium. Um, probably 800 of them came from inside the country and they went back and were producing art inside South Africa in the different art forms. That was an attack on the apartheid regime. That was, I mean, that was incredibly brave to do that and incredibly powerful. And the very fact that they were working under those conditions um, was itself a statement. And <laughs> one of the things that I, I, that shaped me perhaps, was that after the Habaroni raid, so we had a funeral for the people who were killed. Medu had closed, literally closed down the day after the raid. I mean, clearly it had been targeted. Um, but we had a funeral for uh, a number of people in Habaroni, including Tommy Minelli. And the Botswana government said that they did not want us doing any artwork or posters around the funeral because it would be seen as a red flag to, for another South African maid. Um, I actually decided I was not going to <laughs> not do artwork for this funeral. So we did some things, but they were small print runs and a banner and that kind of thing. But we did it illegally and we did get it out. But we had buses arriving with cultural activists from inside South Africa who were taking a chance coming to Botswana at all at that stage. And the ones from Johannesburg, from a group called the Johannesburg Silk Screen Training Project, had a bunch of T-shirts, which they had printed in Johannesburg with pictures of Tommy Mignelli and the slogan, um, uh, lived in the struggle, died our hero. And they printed those in, in, in Johannesburg and carried them across the border for the funeral. Whereas we were being told by the Botswana government, we shouldn't do any political work whatsoever, would not be allowed. <laughs> um, people's courage on these things was incredible. I mean, yeah. 
anyway, um, so that those ideas that came out of Meru actually infused a lot of the cultural work that was done inside South Africa for the next, well, until 1990. Um, but that has not been fully historicized and fully researched. As I said, we're only now, 40 years later, putting together even the collection of the work that Medu did. Um, and just to say, this book came out um, uh, three, three months ago, the end of December. It's called Culture and Liberation Struggle in South Africa. And it's a collection that talks about the history of um, the culture of resistance and the culture of liberation. And um, it is actually really probably one of the best anthologies that I've seen on all of these issues and how the struggle within South Africa, how, how the arts fit into the struggle in South Africa. Um, so, yeah. We're 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 at about an hour. Um, I think. I, mean, I think. I mean, no. I think. I mean, it's. I. I. I want to talk about so much, and of course, these things just zip by. Um, maybe. Maybe I can. I can toss you one more question, and then uh, we can see. Then we can throw it out and see if anyone has any uh, any questions that they can drop into the Q and A function um, in the Zoom. But. But uh, I mean, it seems difficult to open up. The conversation to all everything post may do, even though I, I desperately want to, but but maybe it makes more sense to just ask one more question, which is that you know, for the people that know or remember may do, and even the way that we've been talking about it, it's sort of presented um, as a struggle organization, which of course it was, but also, as far as I understand it, it, it regularly offered classes and sort of art making uh, for youth and just everyday people in Botswana. And, and I, I it's interesting that that part is sort of dropped from the story. And also like, how did that connect to the other work and how it, it seems like that, that could be important. It was important. It was very important. Um, I mean, we, the, the basic, principles of Meru was that it was a collective not only of the people who were the art makers in the collective, but of the community that you were within. Because so many people were obviously exiles from South Africa and saw their, if you like, their home community as the struggle in South Africa, that left one with a question mark of how do you relate to the community actually around you in Botswana. Um, the first time I actually met Tommy Mignelli, I had been given an introduction to him from someone who knew me, someone else, knowing that as an artist, it was sort of a feeling you really ought to find out about Medu and join them if you can. <laughs> Um, but I had a letter and I didn't know where to find him because he was semi underground being in exile. Um, I was told to go to the Botswana Museum and Art Gallery, which was actually quite supportive of Medu. And they told me, well, if you really want to see Tommy Mignelli, he's teaching a class of Botswana kids at what was the Botswana Trade Fair in a building there. And so I <laughs> got into the car and drove to the trade fair. And there was Tommy surrounded by about 35 kids aged, I would guess, between about 7 and 11. Um, all of them hanging on his every word. He was a brilliant teacher and he loved teaching, um, <laughs> amongst other things. 
and um, <laughs> he sort of, well, he, 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 he basically said, sit down while I finish the class. And um, then we talked about where I was coming from and I talked to him about some of the work I'd done in Zambia and Swaziland um, in terms of cultural stuff and how I saw it. And uh, <laughs> he sort of says, okay, I think you need to join Medu. Um, <laughs> it was just, just like that. But the, the, the question of how we interacted with the Botswana community was always an, uh, in very many ways, it was sometimes tense because there was also, I mean, the South African government, the apartheid government would go around and tell the Botswana that we were a danger to them, that one of these days they might do a raid and if they as citizens happened to be living next door, they might get killed. And in fact, some of them were killed. I mean, there was, that was not a, a false. Um, and um, in fact, after the Habaroni raid, they went to a number of houses, including mine. Uh, they sent presumably agents who went to my neighbors and said, you know, this person is going to be next on the hit list and um, your whole neighborhood would be end endangered. And my neighbors actually asked me to move. And I then moved house, I think it was eight times since the next five years <laughs> um, <laughs> because of that in heaven um, But at the same time, there were people in Botswana who who saw themselves as sisters and brothers to the struggle in South Africa and who sacrificed everything they had to support it. Um, and we, in principle, said that we were doing, that the culture that we were doing should speak to people in Botswana as well as speak to people in South Africa. Obviously, the issues were different, um, but many of the artists that we worked with came from Botswana and saw themselves as Botswana artists. In fact, in some ways, because there wasn't, I mean, following the, <laughs> the South African apartheid pattern, there was very little art teaching. In fact, there was no art teaching in the schools until 1980 something or other in Botswana. And in fact, Medu members, not me particularly, but other Medu members were involved in developing the arts curriculum in the schools in Botswana. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, we had Medu members, some of whom became very well-known uh, creative artists of one form or another within Botswana. Um, in different fields. <laughs> so. Gosh, uh, and so you would like to maybe <laughs> get some questions? Sure. I mean, if anyone out there has questions, please drop them in the Q and A section, and 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 Judy can can address them. Um, and now now is a great time to do that. And and while you're while you're typing, um, what you just said just struck me because it it, it echoes so um, deeply with with Mexico over the last twenty years with the the Zapatistas and La Otra Campaña and and you know a central tenant to the organizing is the idea that art is a human right and so organizing on the ground to to get to set up art centers all over um, poor and working class areas in in Mexico, um, it, it 
you know, halfway across the world, but, you know, very parallel struggles. Yeah. I, I think there's a very strong argument that there's parallel development in a lot of these struggles. Some of it's not just parallel. There were um, artists from Chile who, after Allende was overthrown, moved to Mozambique, where they taught, where they worked with a collective of Mozambican artists and, in fact, some South African exile artists um, to do the murals that were painted in Mozambique and became one of the major centers of, of <laughs> art <laughs> in Southern Africa for quite a long time. And um, the main Mozambican artist working with them was Malangatana. But South African, um, actually, um, Albi Sachs, who later became Judge Albi Sachs, um, and was part of the collective that painted the murals in Mozambique in the early 1980s. And Albi was corresponding with us in Medu about how they worked that process. So there was conscious overlap. Um, never enough. <laughs> I think we all felt it was never enough. Um, but there was an awful lot of what you might call simultaneous invention in terms of the way one approached collectives and so forth. Um, and a lot of that stuff also then got fed into the various Pan-Africanist conferences that happened, um, not just Medu, but that whole series of Pan-Africanist conferences. Um, and there's, I think we all have things to learn from that, and it's a history which has been not not given the <laughs> not given the serious attention it needs to be given, if you like. Yeah, the space. Um, yeah. I mean, we certainly talked about the Mexican muralists and the Chilean muralists and said we would like to produce murals in a free South Africa, but that never quite happened the way we intended it to for all sorts of reasons. And I suspect most of my colleagues would say the reason for that is that the in the in the end, South Africa, yes, we won the elections and we forced we forced the elections in a situation which Mandela would be elected and there was a end to the apartheid government. But there were also a whole series of compromises, and some people feel that it didn't go far enough, or there's still a lot more to do. Let's just say there's still a lot more to do. <laughs> um, and one of the things is that the the taking over the streets with people's art didn't happen. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Well, the, the long history of every form being banned, the the banning of the the poster, and then the you know the banning of graffiti, and then the banning of T-shirts, and yeah, um, it's it's a uh, it's difficult to sort of come out of that without a, a hard break. Yeah. And there was a song, there's actually, it was um, written, I think, in the late 50s in the United States, which I was brought up on with my sort of fairly radical parents, um, that goes, freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing. It doesn't come down like summer rain. You've got to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. And I sort of look at <laughs> the world around us and say, right, 
<laughs> we have to win it again. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't downplay the victories we had, but um, yeah, we and we still need to learn from them, and we still need to build upon them, if you like. But there are disastrous things happening around us all the time that also need to be understood and mobilized around and et cetera, and not just in South Africa. In fact, sometimes I think we've come out relatively well out of all of this. I mean, it's not great. I mean, not, not great. It's not everything we thought it would be that's still coming, I hope. <laughs> I'm endlessly optimistic. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yes, very well said. Um, I think we, we, we've got a quiet crowd today. Uh, <laughs> but I think, uh, I think that was a, a, an excellent way to, to bring the, our conversation to a close. And there's obviously a lot more we can talk about. Um, uh, but I want to thank Judy and, and thank Josh. And uh, thank those of you online who joined us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you um, at our next events after a break. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>